Hey, this is Clocking In, where we clock in with local jobs in Malaysia to get a behind-the-scenes experience on what these jobs are all about. I'm your host, Michelle, and it's time to clock in. Hey guys, so today we're clocking in all the way from Tanjung Malim Para at Telur Caviar Farms. So caviar farming is actually when you're part of the entire growing and harvesting process of caviar itself. It's not something you hear very much in Malaysia and that's probably because Telur Caviar Farms is the one and only caviar farm in Malaysia. Let's clock in. The yun is a temperate fish in a cold climate. They best grow in 14 to 18 degrees. If the temperature is up to 20 degrees, it doesn't like to eat anything. If it's up to 22 degrees, it doesn't like to eat anything. If it's up to 23 degrees, it starts to die. If it's up to 22 degrees, it starts to die. If it's up to 22 degrees, it starts to die. Theoretically, that is impossible to raise the yun in Malaysia. In the past, all the thoughts are about the production, 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 the production. So in the past, our thoughts and now, there is a Thank you so much for your time. Because the water is muddy today, we can't take any of the harvesting shots. So we'll come back another day. So the weather is a bit warmer today, so I think the water should be clearer for us to see the fish clearly. My full name is Sean Kenneth Simon. My current position is Chief Marketing Officer for Telokavia. I've been here about a year and three months. We have seven species on the farm. Amo hybrids, beluga, kaluga. Each species has a different size of egg. How you actually affect the grade, right, is actually the size of the eggs. Could you just walk us through why we couldn't shoot the other day? There's a lot of things that happen when rain comes in, of course. Um, the waters get murky. The condition of the water, because we even for the processing area, we use the farm water to actually clean the fish, clean the eggs and everything. So when the water is murky, it affects all the source of water in the farm. Sue will actually explain to you how we monitor the water because he's more involved in the technical aspect. Sue, come join us here for a while. Yeah, sure. When it rains, muddy water from the mountain will flow into our reservoir. Because this muddy water contains a lot of suspended solid. When the suspended solid blocks the fish gill, the fish tends to be stressed and they very hard to breathe. Every time when it's rain, we will bypass the water. Three to four hours after the rain stops, then we will let the water come in again. So how do you monitor the water? I'm actually using the O meter and the pH meter. The O meter measures the dissolved oxygen in the water. We also get the temperature of water. pH meter only measures the pH of the water. Normally, the water will be between 22 to 24 degrees Celsius. Then the pH should be between 6.5 to 7. It's the best for the freshwater fish. What are these fishes doing in here? And there are other ones outside. Is this how you acclimatize them to the weather? We actually acclimatize in the acclimatization room. We slowly move our fish from small, we put it here. Then the temperature on here is actually higher than inside the room. And after that, they grow larger. We move it to the larger tank. Surgeon farming has been established in other countries but their methods are totally different from the way we're doing it. Temperature control is non-existent on this farm. Our founder, he's basically taught them how to be able to survive in Malaysian weather. Advantages is the rate of growth, of course, due to the Malaysian climate. We also have a population issue. We started off the year with 14,000 fishes. We are now at 20,000 fishes on the farm. When you do it with our method, you don't spend as much in terms of machinery. What else do you do? I'm in charge of fighting the fish. Then I'm using ultrasound to see whether the fish got eggs or not. Do you go into the water? We will discharge the water. It, it took almost half day. Until this level, then we go into the tank to find the fish. So this is an ultrasound machine. So this is different from the ones that you use on humans, right? Same. Same? Ah. There are no ultrasound machine on fish. This is the image of the fish. You can see there are obvious dots on it. It shows that there, there are eggs inside the fish body. We normally scan the abdomen part, the stomach, to see whether there are eggs or not. After you ultrasound them, then what do you do? We we'll take it and put it in a quarantine tank. This is the isolation pond usually. Before we take them and we euthanize them, give them a couple of days, we change the temperature of the water. After we isolate and we bring them over there, we begin the entire processing. Once we cut out the belly, extract the eggs, the carcass is actually sent out to be processed for its meat. We deep freeze everything. They go out to business partners who are working with us. Processing for the eggs goes on in the processing plant. And all this has to be done in a temperature controlled environment. So 
now it's lunch break. What is the salary range for a caveat farmer? We have an operational arm, we have a marketing arm. Uh, all of us do get our hands dirty, we do come on the farm and we do work with the fish and everything. On the farm itself, the basic stage we would start off uh, would be to become an operational exec. They start off at about 2005, most of their salaries. For Sue, he actually started off with us during his internship. We were only paying him about 1004 for his internship. On top of that, we provide accommodation, we provide food here on the farm and we promise prospects of growth in the future. Our senior execs take home somewhere along the regions of Poké. Farm manager, 5,000 like that. Director of, of the farm will be taking back about 17,000 a month. Like that. I think that's all the time we have for lunch break. So that's it for lunch. So what's next? We're doing a much a smaller fish compared to what we would usually do. It's an armor siberian hybrid today. We're going to disinfect you and after we disinfect you, then we're going to bring you in. Could you just walk us through the entire process of what's going to happen here until the end? Okay, they'll put him here, we'll pull him all the way to the end here. Once he's on his belly, we will just pierce one point of the fish and then start slowly just going down. I will hold open the fish. Jesslyn will cut the remaining membrane that's holding the eggs together and then remove the eggs into that bowl over there. Once all the eggs have been removed, then we'll push it to the other side, to the windows here. What happens with the male fish when you actually raise them as well? Uh, makan. They're pretty much good for nothing else than to be consumed or to be processed. We do keep some of them for insemination. What are the other uses for sturgeon fish? We're looking into the refinement process of the collagen itself. And you can actually make it into cosmetic products. Intestines from the fish can be used to make sauces. Caviar eggs will make a different type of sauce as well. The fat and everything, we turn it into pure omega oil. You can make shampoo out of the caviar. After we have extracting the eggs, we're going to do sieving. It's my fat or kids hack. So right now we just extract it to separate it. So Sean, you mentioned that there's a time limit to do each room, right? Is there a reason why? If you're soaking them or what or washing them, they get too wet and soggy, or if they're exposed for too long, they start to harden. So the good news is this fish is something that we're using immediately. But if it's something that we're aging, then we have to be very careful. So now we're washing, it's like washing rice. You take a couple of rinses. So once the water gets clear, that's when the caviar is actually ready to move on to the next stage. So this is the netting of course. So we put it here so that the water can drip and then we're going to flatten out the caviar. This part is the tedious one. It's literally back breaking and the tables were made for Asman's height unfortunately. <laughs> What are these white bits that we see there? So those are membrane and fat. We always pull these out, so you see. This is possibly a burst egg. So it's either membrane, burst eggs or anything. And you see, so much of fat there. The egg is entrapped inside there. So you don't want that to go into your caviar. We're going to let you taste it before the salting and after the salting. Is there a reason why people test it on top of their hand? You don't want as much interference as possible from any foreign substance. If you use metal, it adopts a metal property. Caviar absorbs its surroundings very quickly. That's why whenever we use the tweezers and all that, right, we avoid using the tweezers on the caviar itself. So that's why we advocate for the back of the hands. That's a lot of caviar. Push it up to the top. Don't bite. You want it to slowly burst on your palate. It's very creamy, like what you mentioned. It doesn't taste very fishy. There's this fragrance that I can't, I can't really explain. It's a very fruity fragrance, is it? Uh, yeah, yeah, something yeah. like that. So that's the cause of the water. Now that's something unique for our caviar. The salt will bring out the briny flavour later. So that's why you salt the caviar? Salt is a natural preservative right. on top of that. So it brings out the flavour and it also preserves the caviar longer. Today what we're going to do is use Australian sea salt. Something that's more natural to the habitat where they originally come from. Also helps to improve the integrity of the eggs and flavour. It brings out a more briny and more umami kind of flavour in your mouth. Is there a reason why they are pouring it in that way? Slowly, you want to mix it. So you want to do it evenly like uh, they're folding a cake. Otherwise, some parts are more salty than the others. As she folds it, at some point, bubbles will start coming out from the, the water and the salt dries up the bubbles. You just want to take out as much water. So the bubbles are water, basically. So as you can see, the colour is already changing. It's more solid and it's lighter. And then it's just a waiting process. Once it's done, then we will just transfer that, dry it, then after that, we will proceed with the packaging. What is this? like the sea. After the salting, it becomes more firm. Oh. Yeah. Because you've removed the water and everything. After this, uh, so they're going to dry it a little bit. To dry it, you tap it at the bottom. That's how the water gets, gets out a little bit more. Then we push it over there. Over here is where we do the packaging. We will do the weighing and everything there, the final pickings, and then they will put it into the 500 gram tins. Mm. Finally, we will arrange it nicely so that there's no air in between. The air chamber will suck out the air and naturally get the tins to close. Then when we take it out, we will just double check and press down the tin 
thins. That's where the thins play a big part because if not, what will happen is that the eggs at the top, when they are packaged and the air is sucked out, the top of the tin will crush down on the eggs. So if we don't do it properly, that's when they burst and then they start to stew inside there, which is what you don't want at all in your caviar. You have to pack to a certain amount and then when you put the lid on and then you put the weight, air pockets are pushed out. After when you first sit down, where does it go? We have another chiller there. Then we'll leave it there for about one to two weeks before we'll open it and after that we'll repackage it for smaller things. Good caviar should be aged two months. We use a different kind of process because we experiment quite a bit. So before we clock out, where would you want to see the Malaysian caviar industry headed towards? We are looking at a minimum of two years before we fully expand the farm and get the facilities up. By that calculation, we are looking at a total of five years before we can even produce a minimum of 10% of whatever the rest of the world is producing. So we're looking at 10 tons of caviar at the end of five years. We hope to be competing with the rest of them after about 15 years on even ground. Definitely possible. You can come and visit us anytime, but if you really want to enjoy what we are serving actually, hit up some of my partners, look up DC by Darren Chin and Tia by Chef Masashi. So I think now we can all go home. All right. Bye. <laughs> A couple of things I realised is that the people at Telur did such a great job by breaking frontiers, improving that you can actually produce caviar in a tropical country. You're not only doing just one thing, like let's say marketing, but you're also in charge of all the entire processes of taking care of the caviar and processing it as well. Props out to the Telur team. That's all for this episode. Don't forget to subscribe to our YouTube channel and hit that bell icon for any upcoming notifications and like our Facebook page. This is Michelle, clocking out. Bye!